So I am recording this on the 9th of November, which is the day after this heck after strike was, um, has ended. Woohoo. Hopefully this actually leads to a, that the agreement is ratified and that the writer, that the actors get the things that they wanted, increased pay, um, protection and particularly protections against AI, uh, more transparency in terms of, um, metrics for the, um, uh, streaming services like Netflix and all that good stuff. However, this means I can also feel comfortable talking about award season, which is coming up in a few months. And I need to talk specifically about the animation categories, because there is a problem with the animation categories. And that problem is this um not to put too fine a point on it there is a lock on these categories on the lock but yeah it's a lock here that, that makes it difficult for international animation not just anime which i do love a great deal but international animation in general to get in and by way of explanation, I am going to put some links in the show notes for the various award winners, categories, and that sort of thing. Um, for, so, we're going to be focusing here on the Academy Awards for Best Animated Feature and the Primetime Emmy Awards for, uh, well, the Emmy Awards for Animation, the three relevant categories for this. Um... So the problem is, make a long story short, animation, the Academy Awards treats animation as, as far as for the voters, as a exclusive, and basically a kid's medium work. Um, it is not that there are It's not that works that are not meant for children are get nominated, don't get nominated. We have had nominations for works like Persepolis, um, uh, yeah, Persepolis, which is based on a graphic novel about um, a young adult growing up in Iran. We have had movies like, well, Tale of Princess Kaguya, which is an adaptation, yes, of a Japanese folk story but is not complete exclusively meant for children. Whereas on the other side of things, um, that's it. Like if we look at what actually wins, it's almost exclusively kids films. Um, not almost it is exclusively kids films. It's Shrek. It's, um, Incredibles. It's Wallace and Gromit. It's Happy Feet. Even the like sole anime film that's won. Um, Spirited Away, which is an excellent film, and it does 100% deserve the not deserve its win. But it's also a work that it's, I'm not going to say it is the most kid-friendly of Miyazaki's film. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. Like, it is spectacularly kid-friendly. It is, I'd say it's the second most kid-friendly animated of his films, but it's it's not, for example, um, it's not anything like Princess Mononoke. Um, the one Isao Takahata film that's got nominated, while it is somewhat more mature in respects in terms of the, the thematic elements of the tale of Princess Guya as depicted by Takahata, have to deal with um, a, a focus on a parent dealing with the, with the growth of their child, the child grappling with what they want, with their, and what their parent thinks is they want and was right for them. The, and, but it's not by comparison, it's not anything on the comparison of say, um, 
well, not to put too fine a point on it, Takahata's probably most famous film in the West, uh, Grave of the Fireflies, which will break your heart. Uh, when Mani was there is a more somber tale, but it's also, it got nominated, but didn't win. Um, when Miyazaki put out other films, uh, like, like on here, there aren't a lot, like, like he got another second nomination for The Wind Rises, which is, again, probably would have actually fits nicely into his more mature affair. It's a film about adults um, grappling with adult issues, which is, on the one hand, a person who is a excellent aeronautic engineer and a master craftsman who views designing aircraft as being a work of art, but then being tasked to make a machine of war. So, like, The Wind Rises did not, was nominated, deserved to be, but did not win. And honestly, I don't think it had a chance. So, with that in mind, I, we have this year, they're talking about the nomination win discussion of Academy Award nominations for uh, Best Animated Fe Feature for the 2023 awards, which will be given out in 2024. Um, on the one hand, um, The Boy and the Heron is a solid, is a solid contender. Miyazaki Miyazaki's movies have gotten nominated as far as like, since the category was introduced, but it's not likely that this is going to win because it falls into this more it's the more mature side of Miyazaki's work. And not, just, not only does it not stand, not only like the win, but also doesn't stand a chance. And I think that this unfairly holds back more like the, the kinds of international films that are going to get nominated. There are exceptions here. Um, we've had Wallace and Gromit films nominated and won. We've, uh, but by comparison, like the work that Tom Moore has done with uh, Kilkenny on for films like Secret of Kells and films like um, like Wolf uh, Wolf Walkers, those haven't like those have not like they've been nominated. Not only did they not win, they probably did not stand a chance at winning. Flea, a Basically, almost, almost animated documentary about the experience of refugees coming from um, Afghanistan was nominated, deserved to be nominated, did not win. And on and considering the the reasons that like like what the other films that are nominated are. There's a definite sense that it probably did not stand much of a chance. We don't get number like unlike the Hugo Awards, which is takes great pains to be transparent and puts out voting numbers, how many voted for different categories, and how the votes were, were tabulated. The, the Academy Awards do not do this, which stinks. But it gives us. But but if we had that, I suspect there were. Chances, there are chances, but the way the voting was skewed does not favor the more mature films. And a while back, we had a uh, article that was put out by the Hollywood Reporter, taking anonymous statements from vote from Academy member voters in various categories. And one of the things that came up with the Academy uh, with, with the, the animation voters, in addition to racist statements being made about films being made in Asia, that were made from Asia or were perceived to having been made by Asian uh, animators. This was uh, in the 2010s. This was, this was around the 2014 awards. They're referring to uh, Song of the Sea and uh, Tale of Prince of Guya. In addition to referring to them as effing Chinese things, referring to Song of the Sea and Prince Kaguya, 
one of which is made by Japanese people. The other one is made by Irish people. It was also mentioned like by a lot of voters that even if they weren't making explicitly racist statements, they did not necessarily themselves watch the films. Instead, they deferred to their children for what they want, what they felt was the best of these films and what to vote for to win. And that's that again, leave that rules out a lot of the more mature fare, either whether it's PG 13 aimed films um, or just straight up R related films uh, because um, or films just focusing on immature subject matter. Again, getting into stuff here like flea or like Persopolis, those films get blocked, get shut out because those are not like they'll get nominated, but they have a reduced chance of winning or no chance of winning because a kid is not necessarily going to be interested in flea or it might not grab their interest the same way that it would with um, uh, that they would be grabbed by Encanto or Mitchell's first the machines or Raya and the last dragon or loot or that sort of thing. Um, so there is that big barrier there. The Academy themselves has not helped. Um, part of this is by not presenting the best animated short during the broad during the broadcast as my, or reducing how much it's presented so that animated short films are, which tend to be places where more mature fare tends to do um, like the best animated short film is where like you see some of the guys from like Spike and Mike six, Spike and Mike sick and twisted animation festival um, popping up in there. You start seeing stuff like the, uh, like, let's go through the list real quick for some of the nominees and winners there. Uh, it's stuff like, um, i trying to remember the name of the one. Uh, Your Face, I believe, is the one, one of the ones I'm thinking of here that got nominated there. Um, so, um, by comparison, Like oh, that's the rejected Don Hertzfeld was the other thing of like Don Hertzfeld his nomination for best animated short film um, he did not win unfortunately but, he, but the film that did win uh, Father and Daughter is also like a more somber serious fare it's also an international short film it's Dutch. So we had that's that's the place where international animators are given an opportunity to showcase their talent and thrive. And then we, and so I feel like what needs to be done is from what I understand how the rules work in terms of voting is that the voting block, like, okay. So like there needs to be better ways or an expansion of the, of the, the voting block for the account for the for the academy in general um according to the description on wikipedia they say that the entire academy is eligible to vote in the block since the board's inception but i don't know if this is an instance of we have having a for lack of a better term for having a balance of the vote of the voting membership who are coming in not having particularly got 
grown up watching anime or having anime be and international animation in general being part of what they take in uh, and thus having them a certain degree let more biased towards the kitty fair towards my like, kitty is the wrong way of phrasing films aimed at children as someone who grew up again watching Japanese animation this has in turn opened me up opened up my tastes in animation for filmmakers and creators who are doing more mature stuff who are doing stuff like Persophilus who are doing stuff like Flea um, and even for domestic animators for the short categories are do like for people like Don Hertzfeld because and other more mature animators like Michael doing fair like again, for the other winners from that for the winner from that year Michael Dukak DeWitt who I'm probably mispronouncing that because it's Dutch I apologize but for people like him I am open to that fair to the type of stuff because that's what that's the animation that grabbed me once I aged out of kids animation once I aged out of the classic Disney stuff and was not necessarily in a mindset to come back and reevaluate it in terms of individual craft, I then got drawn in by works of animation that were also excellent works of craftsmanship, but also had more mature things to say. I go, um, or ghost of the shell or that sort of, or Akira or, um, Joe Experiments Lane or that sort of thing. And that got me more willing to consider and be open to animation that was aimed for more mature audiences, not just from Japan, but elsewhere in the world. And so consequently, in the case of the academy awards if you have a voting base that is a predominantly like with weighted older i'm not trying to say boomers here but like this is a part of it that their perception of animation has been and always has been in the past and still it consequently is animation is for children they are less open to contemplating and being willing to accept mature animated works and take them on their own merits when it comes to the academy to the nominations. Now the animators who are voting and submitting works um, for what they think should be nominated. We have enough people there where we're getting consistently mature fare on the list. We're considering, we're getting at least one thing, sometimes two things every year that is a little more mature we get we get your isle of dogs we get your the breadwinner we get your um we get your anomalisa we get your um ernest and celestine and we get your well princess kaguya secret of kells that sort of thing we get that on there get one of them as a nomination and it's it ends up feeling less like I mean, it is something of an acknowledgement from the peers in the animation community, but it is fails to become an acknowledgement from the Academy. And what, what makes that, what makes that bad? What makes me go, what freaks is frustrating as opposed to, Oh, who cares about the Academy is this carries over for people who are wanting to get into animation because that people at the art schools who are going to teach you how to do animation and that sort of thing, they will still have those biases of against animation against the more mature fair or in particular works from Japan, because maybe they get recognized once in the blue moon or get nominated, but they never really win anything. It's like, Oh, if you're going to do animation, the people, the studios that are going to be working with, they're trying to get the want to get something nominated for Academy Award. They're going to do kid stuff. And it's not going to look anime style. So you stop doing that. It perpetuates a negative perception of what animation is as an art form. 
this carries over to the Emmy Awards. And this leads to also a weird unbalance. So, it's, so I need to start off by saying that the Emmy Awards are split into two chunks. The, the primetime and daytime Emmys. Often this is related to like, whether a work gets nominated is related to um, what time of day it airs. Um, obviously, primetime and daytime. Also, however, that, that said, there is the, for the animation awards, there is the primetime animation award, and then there is the daytime Emmy award, which is explicitly for outstanding children's animated program. This is like, this award is generally the PBS award and occasionally Disney or Nick Jr. This is the award for, um, Children's animated programs that air during the day that are predominantly somewhat educational, that probably meant to be relatively educational. <clears throat> okay, there's a few things here that I wouldn't necessarily describe as being an educational series, like uh, Trolls the Beat Goes On or um, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but Otherwise, like they're, they're like if you look over the list, it's most mostly kids shows. Even the ones that are more entertainment weighted are usually ones that are entertainment weighted with the side of there's act there's a so, there's a semi moral aimed at each episode. This is not the awards that um, She Ra Princess of Power are going to get nominated for. The other exceptions, I believe we do have like some Animaniacs nominations on here. Um, but and Tiny Toon Adventures nominations, but a lot of the stuff that wins tends to be kind of more educational ish weighted. By the contrast, uh, primetime anim uh, animation awards, a lot of these are either made for TV animated films or specials or are um, animated sitcoms. And as the years have gone on and we've started getting works of animation that are inspired by, um, like, well, Japanese animation or French animation or even the French and Japanese co animated co-productions, we'll start seeing stuff like that there. We'll start seeing uh, things like, for example, um, like we have the Clone Wars getting nominated. We'll see stuff like, um, like Afro Samurai Resurrection managed to get a nomination because it aired on Spike uh, and was a... American co-production. That's um, Arcane, um, and Garrity Tarkovsky's Primal take down taking awards here, but not necessarily stuff like um, I exactly use co-production, but like to for discussing Afro Samurai. But that said, also like Afro Samurai is the one Japanese product. Like, anime series that's or anything with like a real international connection to it that's on here um because the, after that like there's no cyberpunk 2077 that's a co-production with netflix it should theoretically be eligible but it's not and by comparison for the international emmy awards they are only they only have for animation in in its entirety best kids animation they don't have a um best animated feature best broadcast or, or, or just just best primetime any any equivalent of best primetime i mean it creates an imbalance because it also means that any other animated work on television or I would otherwise be eligible for an Emmy Award category that um, doesn't have those options. That's whether it's in the, from Japan, Korea, from India, from the UK or France or wherever. That's just straight up closed off to them. And I think that is a unfair balance. Um, it weights the animated award category 
to a point that I think, like, basically, like, we have a couple of, like, Japanese anime nominations on here. But not much. Uh, admittedly, the category is relatively new. Uh, it was only introduced in 2012. But, and... But again, it's like stuff that even would be pre before Otaku O'Clock, but would be in the prime time. So that was it's a time slot that people would watch it, like that people of all ages would watch it, but not necessarily aiming for the more niche otaku demographic in Japan, for example. Like, uh, but it fall, but which falls outside of what we in the West would consider kids animation, uh, stuff like, well, uh, Gundam, Witch from Mercury stuff like, uh, Demon Slayer, um, is disqualified and anything from any other country that was going to do aim for a similar dramatic series that hits as something that say young adults, teenagers, and their parents would watch together that does not that does not speak down in a way that would turn off parental audiences is off the table. And that is, in my opinion, in, again creates a unreasonable unbalance. Now I realize that Japan has been doing animation aimed for more mature audiences far more regularly and far more critical mass than a lot of the other countries that do get nominated. But, and so this could potentially, if they did do a prime equivalent of the primetime Emmy for best animated feature would end up becoming the, um, the, the, the anime award with occasional nominees, but I don't necessarily think it would be the case. I think that primetime inter animation internationally, when I go over like the international Emmy award list of works, there's some stuff here that I've seen. Uh, there's some stuff here that I have heard of before, like uh, outside of the, like the Japanese stuff where, um, where like I have heard of in passing things like like I want to say like that they um I'd heard of Bluey actually from like some Australian list or like an Australian podcaster or something like that. In particular, um, and the French Peanuts series i'd heard about that um and i reckon i picked up at some point for western distribution um but in any case like, I'd, I'd love to see more options here like here for primetime animation and i'd like to see the academy like academy award voter base have something there to get more younger members in who are willing to give works of Japanese animation the time of and more mature not even just Japanese animation, more works of mature animation the time of day on the nomination list who are willing to go to the screenings or watch on the streaming screener things or what have you go watch Wolf Walkers or go watch um Mirai, who will watch Isle of Dogs, who will watch Flea and go, actually, Soul's good, but I really like Wolf Walkers. Um, I like its queer subtext. I, or they watch, who will watch, um, like, 
to put it another to watch the um the the uh the breadwinner and go no actually this this is a really like this is a good movie i like this uh or loving vincent like actually 2017 is probably like a spectacular example of this because it is the year where we have like two of the more mature films make the nomination list um and like with with the breadwinner with loving vincent and who are willing to and, and where if we had a voter base we like, we could have gotten a more mature film taking home the award ah well um that's my like that's my bummer is like like looking over the short list for that year of uh, the films that were submitted like that was the year that had uh Mary and the Witch's Flower nominated the first film from studio for Ponock, a bunch of former uh alumni of uh, former alumni, alumni of studio ghibli which the year that had in this corner of the world which is a film uh, which is a film about the bombing of hiroshima and instead like also like having for that matter a lighter ex nomination base for the best animated feature as well it was probably the other thing both in terms of having a wider array of people nominating works in terms of having more people in, but also expanding the number of nominees is probably be the other thing. Um, like best animated feature, like best feature film at the moment. Um, for best picture um, has tends to go like they increase the number of films to 10. And with best animated feature, because we have like, this is like the, like this, like the, the only animated film, like animated category we really have. Whereas we have like basically everything else for best regular feature, um, like best actor nominations tend to not happen for animated feature. They don't consider voice acting having the same weight. Um, it writing nominations sometime like, maybe show up but not nor normally um best song does tend to frequently be animated get picked up by um animated features but that's about it not best direction either um so if best animated feature got an expansion to 10 um i feel like we would have gotten i think that would also help expand the number of more of more of the international films and more mature films. Like again, if we'd gotten like 10, I could see in this corner of the world making it in uh, for 2017. Um, well, if I look at 2022, like 2022, we had, um, we had Iduo from uh, Masaki Yuasa which is more violent than some of these other films, than other eminent films will necessarily willing to go. We had Richard Linklater with Apollo 10 and a half. We had, um, we had, um, hell. We, we got freaking, um, Wendell and Wild, um, which, which is Key and Peel and Henry Selleck doing a stop motion, more more mature aimed animated film. We had Mad God from Phil Tippett. <clears throat> like hell, Mad God should have been nominated. As much as 
Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio needed to be on there, like deserved its nomination and deserved its win. Uh, holy crap, mad God. Um, and we didn't get it, and that's a bummer. And it would have been wonderful if we just gotten like had some of these more international films on here. So these are films from um, producers in from studios and voices which don't normally get to show up in the Academy Awards. Again, I bring up 2017 here because 2017 is the year that boss baby got nominated. You know, Boss Baby, the movie, the subject of, of all the memes about, oh, this is reminding me a lot of Boss Baby, says per, this person who's only ever watched Boss Baby, because it's not, it's not exactly a great film. Um, Whereas by comparison in that year, we had, you know, in, in this corner of the world, we had Ethel and Ernest, um, which is based on a Raymond Briggs graphic novel. We had, oh, wow. Well, um, we had Mary and the Witch's Flower, which didn't get nominated. We had um, a Silent Voice, which didn't get nominated, and which I, some of the people who worked on that film are no longer with us because of the Kyoto Animation arson. Like, that was one of the first, like, Kyoto Animation's first big shots at Gating an Academy Award nomination. Um, so, yeah. The Academy needs to do better. I'm the... And not just the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sinus, Sciences. Uh, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences needs to do better. They need to either do parody, go establish parity in animation categories for both international and domestic animated productions, or they need to make for the primetime Emmy Awards, they need to open it up to international films, international works. Because I'd rather, because if, if that meant that, oh, South Park doesn't get nominated this year, or The Simpsons doesn't get nominated this year, or Rick and Morty doesn't get nominated in it this year because some obscure but really cool look, really cool animated um, series from Japan or Korea or China or India or France or the UK or Canada gets nominated. Give me that. That's what I want. And that is my rant for this week. As I, which, as I give, um, the, this will be going up the week after KimuraCon. I will do a con report blog post once after after KimuraCon. Maybe adapt that into a video in uh, for the first video of December. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Tossing me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.